the patients who are transplant ineligible also really need to benefit from our novel agents. And uh, I actually did an educational session uh, at the American Society of Hematology this year, which really informed and educated caregivers on how to assess the concept of frailty. And frailty is not just performance status. It involves many features of the disease, but in particular of the patient, that can classify patients either as fit or frail. And the reason that's important is frailty in patients with myeloma has been as important or actually even more important than age or cytogenetics as a risk factor. So if we actually have a frail patient who's not eligible for transplant, which is not uncommon, they have, uh, they're elderly and they have comorbidities, for example, we can dose adjust the drugs so that they can receive triplet therapies. I'll mention to you that a common doublet therapy that has been popularized is lenalidomide dexamethasone given continuously. That was as a consequence of the first trial, a randomized trial of lenalidomide dexamethasone continuously versus lenalidomide dexamethasone for 18 months versus lenalidomide dexamethasone, I'm sorry, versus malphalan prednisone and thalidomide. So lenalidomide dex continuously was superior and was a standard of care. But we have two or and maybe more options coming where triplets are commonly used in myeloma. The most common one right now is called Revlimid Belcade dexamethasone or lenalidomide bortezomib dexamethasone where the doses have been reduced. It's called lenalidomide bortezomib dex RVD light because the doses have been reduced. 15 milligrams of lenalidomide daily for two weeks, dexamethasone 20 milligrams orally once a week, and Valcade 1.3 milligrams per meter squared weekly. And this RVD light can really achieve responses on the one hand and be well tolerated on the other in myeloma. Now I'll mention one clinical trial that was uh, presented at the American Society of Hematology as a late breaking abstract and it's a triplet where daratumumab was added to lenalidomide and dexamethasone for the first time in the transplant ineligible patients. And in that setting the lenalidomide dexamethasone progression free survival was 31.9 months and when you added daratumumab, it was not yet reached. That particular study showed a 45% reduction in the rate of progression or death when one added daratumumab to lenalidomide and dexamethasone. I mention this because this is an example, in addition to RVD light or lenalidomide bortezomib of dexamethasone, daratumumab lenalidomide dexamethasone as of this time, appears to be a very active and well-tolerated initial therapy in transplant ineligible patients. In the transplant ineligible patients, actually, we've made a lot of advances uh, more recently, which is uh, very reassuring because, you know, uh, most of us talk about survival in myeloma, which has improved significantly, and most of us attribute that survival to um, transplant. Uh, at this year's ASH, we saw for the first time uh, data which was presented from the Maya trial, and this was um, a step up from the first data. Now, if you go back to the first data, this was a trial where for the first time, the first trial actually showed us that continuous therapy in multiple myeloma makes a difference. Now, that was a study which compared RD for a stipulated time frame, RD continuous, and then compared it to MPT. And the RD continuous was the winner in that arm. And that was considered sort of the standard of care. So building up on this first trial, 
Theory Facon presented really nice data at this year's ASH, which was a Maya trial where the control arm was RD continuously and the addition of daratumumab, the monoclonal antibody, to the RD arm, the question was, is that going to make a difference? Now, what you have out here is a remarkable benefit in terms of a progression-free survival benefit. The RD arm had a survival of about 30 months or so for a median follow-up of about 27 months, and the median for the RD DERA arm has not yet been reached. It's close to about 70, 75% or so, which is quite remarkable in this patient population. Uh, clearly, we haven't seen the overall survival data. It's too early, but given that this was generally well tolerated, you have only added on a monoclonal antibody. You did not compound the toxicity of RD by adding on the daratumumab has, is going to be a practice changing uh, trial in the future, I think. And I do think people are going to be using daratumumab in combination with RD, specifically if you look at the fantastic progression-free survival benefit that we're seeing in our patients. A number of clinical trials show that triplets are better than doublets. And there are exceptions to this. Individuals who are uh, frail, uh, who have a number of comorbidities, may be better off treated with a doublet. And there's quite a bit of subjectivity in how we would go about choosing uh, such patients. But I would say for the standard um, non-transplant candidate, a triplet will be uh, better. Now, how is that done? Well, there's a number of, uh, of approaches. In the United States, we've used mostly the combination of bortezomib, landexamethasone, the, the RVD or VRD. And then there's, there's a light word added to that because there's some dose adjustment that is done uh, for the elderly. Now, in European countries, uh, the combination of bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone has been one of, one of the uh, backbones for therapy for, for the elderly patients. So a study was uh, uh, published and has been discussed in greater detail, including at the recent ASH meeting, the so-called Alcyon study, where they looked at the combination of bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone plus daratumumab, showing the superiority of that combination. Dr. Uh, Dimopoulos presented the data. It's over 700 patients. And at least from, from, from uh, the data, uh, we can see the, the median progression-free survival was not reached. I believe they had a follow-up of about 27 months, whereas it was 19 months for the, for the triplet combination there with, uh, uh, with uh, bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone. Now, that's a regimen we're not using as much in the United States just because we don't use Melflan, but as, as we're discussing uh, and in this series of videos, the alternative is a combination of daratumumab, len and dexamethasone, the so-called Maya study, which really has uh, uh, very, very uh, interesting and positive results. I, I personally think, and um, I know there's a range of opinions here, but I personally think this is practice changing. I think this is a new standard, and that's what I'm doing for uh, most of my patients. Now. Uh, to some degree, the Alcyon study was not as impactful here in the United States just because we don't use melphalan, but there's a lot of lessons buried there. And, and two that I would like to highlight, number one, uh, just like the Maya study, they found that the majority of patients are standard risk. In, in, the, in both studies, it's about 85%. This is, this is a very important fact because uh, high-risk disease is more common in the younger population, and the, the older population is more commonly uh, composed of patients that have standard risk, including hyperdiploidy. And this has been published now for over 10, 15 years. We, we know this data to be very solid. Now, this is very relevant because we need to understand the impact of risk stratification as we select some of this combination. So, for instance, if you, know, if you have some of these high-risk markers, as we have traditionally done, do you still include a proteasome inhibitor? These are very, very um, uh, important questions that, that need to be uh, considered as we select uh, some of these regimens. And I think we need to look also at other aspects of long-term toxicity because uh, the studies, even though, again, we're not using the melphalan, will give us a good representation of what uh, some, some of the potential toxicities might be for these regimens. All in all, it's a great time uh, for multiple myeloma because of the progress that continues to, to show up at our meetings.